Good afternoon, everybody. A very, very warm welcome to today's webinar, Taking the Grief Out of Grievance. This is by far and away the most popular webinar that we've ever run at TCM. Um, it seems to me that um, the message is really resonating with HR professionals and business leaders who are very keen to try and find an alternative way of resolving disputes, conflicts, disagreements. Of course, it goes by many different names within organisations, but there seems to be a real appetite to see if there's an alternative way of dealing with these issues. My name is David Little. I'm the Chief Executive and the founder of the TCM Group, and I have with me my colleague today, uh, Jerome Witter. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, we look forward to, to um, presenting the case for the need for change in the way that we handle internal disputes, complaints, and conflicts within the modern organization. So the webinar is going to last around about 45 minutes. Uh, we've already had questions coming through, so thank you very much for those. So I, I guess it's dependent a little bit today in terms of how many questions we get, but please do feel free um, at any time today to, to, to pop a question into the questions box. You simply need to type it. We'll make a note of that, and we will come to as many of the questions as we can do over the course of the webinar. If I don't get a chance to answer all of them, then we'll come back privately with any responses. Yeah. And of course, you can always ask questions offline through email or through LinkedIn. The webinar is being recorded and we will send you a link uh, once it's been um, uh, edited uh, in terms of uh, topped and tailed and the link will come through probably tomorrow. I'll also um, organise for it to be transcribed so you can have a written transcription of the webinar as well. There will be polls, a couple of polls through the uh, through the webinar. Two, we'll have, polls, two polls, that's yeah. right, Jerome. So we'll uh, have a couple of opportunities for you to, to, to give us your thoughts and your views around conflict management and the role of the grievance procedure. Um, after the webinar, I'm also going to send you a free copy of the TCM model resolution policy. I'll be referencing that throughout the uh, webinar today. Uh, I'll send you a copy of that. That's yours to keep um, after, after the webinar, and hopefully that will help you to transform the way that disputes and conflicts are handled in your organization. So we've just hit 200 uh, attendees, give or take, so um, that's really fantastic for us as an organization. So I'd just like to say a very warm welcome to all of you, particularly those of you who are just joining us at the moment. Um, the webinar's only just begun. Uh, my name's David, and I have here Jerome Witter with me. So please do enjoy the webinar. Um, hopefully you can hear the... Oh. Ah. Can people hear? I've just had a couple of messages saying that you can't hear me. Uh, it's saying, however, that the sound is looking okay. Can you... You can, you can hear okay. So there are people that people can hear okay. Um, so... Grace and Kate, I'm apologies. You're, you, there may well be a problem here. So thank you. I'm having lots of messages. Sally, Haley, Felicity, Denise, uh, Nina, Gloria. Thank you so much. You can obviously hear. Okay, Beverly as well. That's great to hear. So uh, for those of you who can't hear, there may well be a problem at your end. Sarah, thank you so much for your message as well. So there's me. I'm David. I'm a mediator, a teacher and a leader with over 20 years experience in the field of conflict management. I grew up in Nottingham. Um, I currently live in London with my wife and my two kids, two guinea pigs and another on the way, as I say, not uh, a baby, that is, not another <laughs> guinea pig, although I think the kids would like that. My background is in race relations. I have a degree in race relations. And my first um, foray into dispute resolution was in the, uh, in, the uh, in the city of Leicester. My first work there was working as a tenant uh, participation officer as part of a regeneration program in Leicester, and I saw firsthand the, the, the damaging nature of conflict, violence, and disputes within our communities. I set up one of the first non-violence and community mediation programs in the country in 1993, and very quickly started to apply the principles of mediation across community disputes within and between families. I set up a program called CRISP, the Conflict Resolution in Schools program, which I was very proud to have featured in a BBC documentary in 1997. And I also worked in the area of restorative justice, which was bringing victims and offenders together to address uh, issues relating to offending behavior, a lack of empathy and a lack of understanding as an attempt to try and reduce recidivism rates for young offenders across Leicestershire. Um, and I've been a real fan of restorative processes and their use within organizations. Um, in 1997, I was invited to bring some of these approaches into a workplace setting. And I was surprised. I thought everyone got on well in workplaces, Jerome. <laughs> I thought everyone was happy. Only here. Only, yeah. <laughs> only at PCM. I like that. Um, and uh, I was surprised because I'd been working with, a, uh, with victims who told me that when they have their handbag stolen, their house robbed, uh, whatever the offence was, 
they couldn't sleep at night, they were worried, they were anxious, they were fearful, they were scared, they were afraid, they were damaged and hurt. I went into organizations and talked to people about conflict in the workplace. They told me they were scared, they were frightened, they were damaged, they were hurt. And one lady, I really, I remember this very clearly, she was telling me about her experience of conflict in the workplace and she told me, it feels in the morning like I've got bricks in my belly when I walk into the workplace. How can an organization uh, secure, product, productive, uh, engaged, happy, um, harmonious teams and employees with people walking around our organizations with bricks in our bellies? It's not possible. So I looked at organizations and asked, and asked those organizations, what are we doing about this? And I would see a grievance, a dusty old grievance procedure would be pulled out. And this is what we're doing about it, David. And my analysis then, as it is now, is the response was woefully inadequate. And I'll talk more about today about why I believe the grievance procedure is woefully inadequate and why more progressive approaches. Jerome, are they progressive? Is talking and listening progressive? It's the key. It's the key. It's not progressive. It's the only true way of resolving our disputes. But we do so much nowadays to actually prevent and inhibit people talking and listening to each other. We're almost fearful of creating an environment where people can be open, honest, frank, and have a candid and honest conversation about their feelings, their needs, their hopes, their goals. So I'm a frustrated author and blogger. I've got a book in me. I've just been commissioned to write a book on the role of mediation within a whole systems model within organizations. And I'm also the founder and the pres president of our trade body, the Professional Mediator Association. So um, you yeah, have some experience in, in the field uh, of, of this area. So TCM, uh, you may or may not know us. I know there's a number of our customers on this webinar. So for those of you, a very warm welcome uh, to the webinar. We've been in business now for 14 years. Our real passion is set up integrated mediation schemes. And we've worked with BT, EDF Energy, Lloyds Bank, uh, Department for Work and Pensions, Royal Mail, some big organizations to embed a culture of mediation and resolution into those organizations. We employ a full-time team of mediators, of whom um, uh, Jerome is one of those mediators and trainers, and we have associates all over all over the world. And there's some of our clients that we work with, and I'll draw on some of those as examples through the webinar, and we're accredited by Customer First, for those of you who are familiar with that. It's a rigorous process of accreditation to make sure that our customers are at the center of everything that we do. I know one or two of you are still having problems with your audio. I hope that's getting fixed for you, um, and I hope that you are able to, to listen to the, to the webinar. So here's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with here, Jerome. On one level, it's low level. And it's often described to me as being petty and trivial. It's falling out, not seeing eye to eye, disagreement, feuds. And perhaps as it becomes more serious, we talk about the conflict in terms of grievance, harassment, bullying, discrimination. As it becomes more serious too, we start to move away from the notion of the psychological contract, the relationship, the unwritten rules, and we start to talk about the employment contract. Mm -hmm. And here we start to think about litigation, employment tribunal, settlement agreements, COP threes, early conciliation. The language becomes hardened uh, and more polarized. But what we're talking about, in, in, in essence, is conflict. And, and the impact of conflict. And the impact of conflict, and how we feel in conflict, how we behave in conflict, and how we react to each other in conflict. Conflict is ubiquitous. Conflict happens wherever there's relationships. And as a, a conflict management expert, I often think of myself as being a PR agent for conflict <laughs> before I even begin to resolve it. Because conflict doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be destructive. It doesn't have to be harmful. It's the way that we manage it. And unconsciously, the grievance process, which pitches people against each other, it polarizes the parties. It pushes them into a win-lose, right-wrong uh, mentality. Unconsciously, our organizational policies and procedures actually ensure the conflict becomes destructive. I would suggest that we get the behaviors we deserve. And in conflict terms, the grievance process actually drives those negative and destructive behaviors that many HR professionals, business leaders, line managers tell me they don't know how to deal with. Well, perhaps let's do some root cause analysis and work out when these two people are fighting, screaming, scrapping, in, in disagreement, how can we resolve it? Well, the current paradigm for dispute resolution under a grievance process is an attempt to achieve a black or white outcome. Well, it's not black or white, Jerome. We know that, yes, of course. We can't look at conflict in black and white terms. We can't look at it in terms of achieving a 51% on balance of probability, passing the virtual test. Um, there's a wrongdoer and a rightdoer. Conflict is more complicated than that. 
but our current systems and approaches for resolving disputes actually encourage di directly in the past of these kind of behaviours. I win, you lose. I'm right, you're wrong. It's all your fault. You're a bully. I'll see you in court. Who do you think you are? I can't trust you. Don't blame me. And how many times do we hear this language and communication when people are sucked in to the grievance process, pre-grievance, during grievance or post-grievance? This is destructive language. It's harmful language. It inhibits professional relationships. It undermines um, the, the relationship between the two parties. And it's very, very difficult to come back from there. In fact, I was speaking to someone recently about a grievance that she'd taken out against her manager, and she said to me, I know having done this, David, my relationship will never be the same again. Research tells us that the majority of people who take a grievance will have left the organisation within two years of having taken out the grievance. And from a manager's perspective, revenge is a dish often mm -hmm. best served mm -hmm. cold. You lose talent. You lose never talent. to the root of the actual conflict in the first place. Absolutely. And you lose trust. Mm -hmm. And trust is the cement that holds our relationships together. A breakdown in trust is the antithesis of employee engagement, is the antithesis of productive relationships, is the antithesis of high performing teams. And trust is so vital, it's so important. The grievance process, unconsciously, subconsciously, is eroding trust in our businesses right now. And all it's doing is sat there quietly in our employee handbook, minding its own business. No, it's not. It's pernicious and damaging. Now, the grievance process and other processes similar to the grievance process in terms of dispute resolution, and of course, I'm not talking about dispute resolution in the traditional sense. The grievance process is not a dispute resolution tool. Let's be clear about this, Joe. The grievance process is a dispute escalation tool. It's about escalation of the disputes until we get to a point where, on balance of probability, we can achieve some kind of analysis or determination. It does not seek to address the root cause of the conflict. We might have a paragraph called informal resolution, and I'm going to come to informal resolution and do a critique of that, but you still have to get into grievance to get into informal resolution. The, the, the lines have been drawn. The damage is being done. Informal resolution, actually, in many cases, is doomed before it's begun. Now, organizations, and you'll see here on the uh, model in front of you, focus very well on destructive behaviors. And what we find when we're working with HR professionals and others within organizations is we are very adept at predicting the worst possible behaviors of our employees and creating a policy framework around those behaviors that mitigate or reduce the harm to us, the organization, and to our employees. And the latest policy in most suites of policy frameworks will be a social media policy to prevent people tweeting or putting on Facebook comments about the employer. And we're very good at protecting the employer from the 0.01% of people who are out to do us harm. What those procedures don't do, whilst they are risk averse in and of themselves, is they don't address the 99.99% of the population who are actually there to deliver good service and work hard. Um, so we're focusing in on behaviors is perhaps the wrong, the wrong area. As a mediator, the way I look at behaviors is they are a symptom of a, of, a, of a problem. Now, the problem is that the individuals in the conflict's needs aren't being met. My need to be heard, respected, valued, taken seriously, treated with respect, treated fairly and equally as with my colleagues, those needs aren't being met. And as a result of that, Jerome, people experience, as you know, as a mediator, as I've seen many times, people experience a profound sense of loss a loss of hope, a loss of esteem, a loss of faith, a loss of confidence. These are powerful forms of loss that have a significant and detrimental impact on that person. They become a belief. They, they, they impact on the belief system. And actually then we look at the person's behaviors and they're almost fitted into the belief system that we've created, which is that you're out to do me harm. So I start to defend myself from you. <laughs> and what's the best form of defense? Attack. Attack. So very quickly in conflict we see defensive positions adopted, Attack being the best form of defense or withdrawal, and we start to see this becomes the norms. And this form of loss drives these emotional and psychological responses driven by powerful hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, that cause us to take a what's traditionally known as the fight, flight, freeze, or fall response to conflict, the four Fs of conflict. Um, none of those actually create an environment where we can resolve the conflict. But what they do do is they impact on the way that we talk to each other, the way we interact, the way we act, and the way that we react is the air of the conflict of our relationship changes, and that in itself drives the destructive behaviors. 
So if this is a conflict life cycle, the question for our organizations is this, Jerome, is are our organizations sufficiently aware that conflict exists in this way? And have they got sufficient measures and steps in place to address conflict at the point where we start to see loss and strong emotions? Early intervention. Exactly. Now, I would suggest that there's two things that strike fear into the heart of most managers. I'll forgive my crudeness here, um, everyone on the webinar. <coughs> Snot and tears. <laughs> and, I, and I say that with, with, genuinely. Managers I speak to then ask how their employee feels because they are not confident, they're not competent and not courageous enough, and they don't feel they've got support to ask their employees how they feel. And as a result of not asking people how they feel, they can't understand what their needs are. And the reason we don't ask people how we feel is our sense is if I ask the wrong question, there will be a grievance against me or a bullying allegation brought against me. Do you know something, Jerome? It's easier not to say or do anything. What the parties are crying out for is to be heard and to be listened to. They're screaming out, listen to me, please understand my point of view. Try and put yourself into my shoes. And we can't do that when we're directly avoiding the issue. And I would suggest to organizations that in terms of conflict resolution, grievance management, complaints resolution, we need to go and give our employees a jolly good listening to. And I would suggest if there's one clause in our grievance process, whatever that might become, is to have a jolly good listening to clause. Appreciation, recognition, understanding, and empathy. Wow. When we have that in our relationship, now we're talking stronger, more, perform, more productive relationships. So here's the language. Well, I've, I've, I've done many surveys. I've worked with many organizations to try and understand the nature of grievance. And this is what people tell me they, they, they hear by the word grievance. Formal, adversarial, it's judgmental, it's about blame, it's, it's right-based, it's draconian, divisive, it's about win-lose outcomes. But people, on the other hand, talk to me about the word resolution. It feels more informal, it's empathetic, it's about dialogue, listening, it's non-adversarial, it's collaborative, it's values-based. I'm going to come back to values, Jerome because it's so important. It's about consensus. It's about win-win outcomes. Now, when I walk into an organization, an NHS trust, a retailer, a distribution center, wherever it might be, I look at the values up on the wall. Organizations do not have values up that have the word combat, battle, <laughs> scrap, fight, disagreement, hatred, betrayal. Those aren't the values of the modern organization. The values of the modern organization are about excellence, empathy, respect, dialogue. So how do we get to a point where our grievance process is so, it's, oper it's operating in complete opposition to the values of the modern organization? It's inhibiting the organization delivering its values and actually walking the talk. Maybe the time has come to change the vernacular, to reframe the paradigm that we work with when it comes to dispute resolution. So when it goes wrong, uncertainty. Fear, suspicion, stress, cliques, disengagement, rumors, and gossip. We've all experienced this at one time or another in our professional lives. And as a mediator, I experience it perhaps more than many others where I'm asked to go in and help resolve these issues. And they all stem from a form of loss. And as a mediator, the first thing I ask the parties to describe is what do you need and how does it feel when your needs aren't being met and what do you need tomorrow? And do you know something? They'll tell you. They know what needs to change. And the parties have an enormous capacity in conflict to change the situation and to resolve it. They don't need determination panels. They don't need formal processes. They know what they need. We need to create an environment where interest-based and needs-based negotiation are the norm within our businesses. And the end result of all of this, the managers are confused. You know, for those of you who've introduced the Auric model or HR business partner, and you'll know that the transactional management of the famous five policy areas, performance, capability, discipline, grievance, absence, um, uh, are driven primarily by the line manager at the early stage. But no one's told the line manager how to do it, what to say, how to say it. But what the manager does know is they've got the responsibility to do it. And HR are wanting to add value to the business and kind of contribute in relation to talent, engagement, and well-being. So there's a disconnect between HR and the, the, the manager. And people then look at the HR professional and say, well, on one hand, you're the custodian of value-adding strategic priorities. And on the other hand, you're the custodians of these processes which tear our relationships under 
and actually stress us out. And it's a massive HR paradox, as I call it, Jerome. A real issue for HR professionals. What are you? Are you the police force of the modern organization or the enablers of real talent and driving the productivity in the business? And until we can answer this question, employees are fearful. Again, I was talking to some parties about their experience of HR, and if they said going to HR is a threat. If, if it goes to HR, it's a threat. How did going to HR be a threat? So managers lack the courage, the confidence, and the confidence to deal with the situation. Our managers are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They really are. Our HR are unable to deliver their core function uh, effectively. We know they're doing a lot more with a lot less. The grievance procedure is getting in the way. It takes time. It takes them away from doing what they really should be doing or want oh, to do. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying everyone on the webinar here has enormous grievance cultures. Many of you may not have had a grievance in the last two years, but some of you may have had 200 grievances in the last two days. It's, every organization is different, but you're absolutely right, Jerome. What we do know is when grievances are around, they, tap, they sap time and, and, and energy. So they create this, this, this reactive culture. You have to press the nuclear option to even begin a dispute escalation process with a mirage of procedural fairness and a mirage of dispute resolution. It's neither of those things. It's a risk minimization process which has driven dispute escalation. And it leads to dissatisfaction, attrition, litigation, unhappiness. We see these on staff satisfaction surveys, employee engagement surveys. We run employee surveys ourselves. We run diagnostics. We're hearing this time and time again. I've never spoken to an employee who's been through a grievance process, and this is hand on heart, who's been through a grievance process, who's come out of the other side and said, wow, that was a positive experience. <laughs> This is the it dispute. Happen. It doesn't happen. This is the dispute resolution process of choice in our organisations. We don't have to have this process, by the way. The dispute resolution regulations were repealed in 2007. The modified three-step grievance and dismissal processes were repealed in 2007. In 2008, we saw the new Employment Act come into effect, the ACAS Code and ACAS Guidance. Organisations, however, still have a modified three-step process. You don't have to have a grievance process. You do have to, on the other hand, follow the minimum guidelines in the ACAS code, but you can call it whatever you like. So organizations actually are actively choosing these processes. There's no enforcement to make you have them. And the costs, wow, they spiral. Uh, incredibly. We, we set up, again, mediation programs in big transport infrastructure organizations, big retailers, and we'll start off by doing forensic mapping of the cost of those conflicts. It is incredible. We set up the BT mediation program, and um, Caroline Waters, who's unfortunately no longer at BT, head of people and policy at BT, spoke at a conference that I organized uh, a year or so ago now, and she reported as a result of introducing mediation into BT Group, having run a, uh, a uh, pilot in BT Retail, a saving drone of a million pounds in the first year directly attributable to mediation. A million pounds. One thing was for sure, Jerome, we weren't charging BT enough. <laughs> <laughs> so the existing dispute resolution system, this is my kind of closing remarks on this before we, um, we have a little poll and give you a, a talk here. Um, they are reactive. They are inherently adversarial. They polarize the parties. They rarely get to the root cause of conflict. Needs are not um, met. They impede creativity. And they create a culture which is in itself pernicious, damaging, and destructive. And if you want to collect the evidence for yourself, you know, there's more and more evidence out there. There's CIPD research, CBMA research. I mean, we've got masses and masses of data here at TCM. There's an enormous amount of data. But the data that really counts is your data, your story, your narrative. And here's a, here's a little assessment toolkit that you can use. By the way, um, Brenda, thanks for your question. Can the slides be emailed after the webinar? Absolutely. I'll send you the slides. I'll send you a copy of the TCM model resolution policy. We're also going to send you a link to the webinar so you can pass that to friends or colleagues or listen to it at your own, um, you know, your own leisure. Um, and also this public <laughs> assessment talk is quite, quite useful. But we have some more forensic tools and diagnostics which we're very happy to share. But what's the real cost of conflict to your business? How many sick days do you have as a result of conflict? How many grievances do you get? How much do they cost you? Do you measure that? How much do we spend on settlement agreements and payoffs? What impact does conflict have on engagement and satisfaction? How much management time is spent dealing with these issues? Is workplace conflict impacting on customer experience? There is increasing evidence that conflict in the workplace is having a negative impact on customer experience, particularly the news at the moment in relation to whistleblowing, Jerome, in the NHS. I've worked in the NHS for many, many years, and my experience is that where there's conflict in the workplace, it has a direct impact on patient okay. outcomes. 
This has been picked up by Bruce Keogh in the Keogh report and Francis in the Francis report into mid staffs. And the argument from Keogh is, if we read through the report on the trust put in special measures, there's a direct relationship between patient mortality rates, people dying as a result of unresolved conflict in clinical teams and surgical teams and some of the trusts that were put into special measures. That's very serious and cannot be ignored. So do you train your managers um, to spot issues and to nip them in the bud? Is soft skills out of fashion in your organization, or have you dragged soft skills into the 21st century? Because they aren't soft skills, Jerome. They are key, vital management skills. So there's a little poll here. So we'll run our first of two polls. So the question for yourselves is, is your grievance procedure effective at resolving disputes or conflicts? So I'd love to hear your thoughts. So the poll's going to come up now. So it's simple, yes or no. Is your current grievance process effective at resolving disputes or grievances? With the word resolution uh, being the, uh, the core, the key term, does it get to underneath the surface and really resolve the issues? So that's three quarters of you have voted out of the 230 on the webinar at the moment. I'll publish the, the, uh, the results in a moment. That's 82. I'll give it another five seconds and then I'm going to close the poll. This number is still voting. Okay. I'll close the poll now. So just to share this with you, um, the poll said 33% of you are um, finding that your grievance process is helping to resolve disputes. Fantastic. I'd love to hear some more stories about that because um, those of you, I'm, I'm assuming you may have some provision for mediation already in those uh, procedures and you may well already have some of the more progressive employee relations procedures uh, elements in that process, but that's fantastic. But a whopping 67% of people here today are saying, you know something, our grievance procedure isn't effective at resolving dis disputes. The dispute resolution procedure of our organization is failing. And maybe this is an opportunity to um, to revisit that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So we'll move on. Um, actually, we've got questions that have been coming through um, so far. So let's just have a look. I know, Jeremy, you've been making a note of some yes, of these as they've been coming through. So a first question came in from Leslie, which was, uh, how can we get out of a circle of disciplinaries, counter grievances, and then the employee goes on, for example, stress leave, Occupational health get involved. Often GP reports are asked for and they still aren't getting anywhere. How can the resolution model help in that situation? Wow, 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 wow. This is a this is a, such a typical situation as well. It's a real spiral, a vortex almost, as Leslie described it in my mind, where we just move from process to process to process to process and increasingly we're seeing stressed out people, stressed out managers, stressed out employees, taking more and more time away from the workplace becoming more and more detached and disengaged, ultimately where they have long-term sickness or unfortunately have no choice but to leave the organization. One of the ways of stopping that, Leslie, is encouraging the parties to come together and have a conversation with each other. Now that sounds easy, doesn't it, on a <laughs> webinar to say. It requires enormous courage, enormous confidence on the part of the parties to come into a room and engage with each other. But when we can help the parties to have the courage we can support them, we can create the conditions for dialogue, establish the, a safe space for people to talk, to listen, to hear each other. Unbelievable things can happen. And current procedures keep people apart. It's never about bringing people together to actually resolve the issues. It's about keeping them apart. Jerome, it is. I, I remember talking with uh, an HR professional recently, and they had the two very senior managers that brought a, grievance, a counter grievance against each other, so Leslie, not dissimilar to your situation. And the organization was investigating the two um, grievances that had been raised. They were very serious. And the HR director said quite correctly to our two protagonists, if you speak to each other, you will be subject to disciplinary action. And I remember hearing that. And I remember thinking this thought, the world has gone mad. <laughs> At a time where we should do in everything that we can to get those two people in a room to settle their differences, Procedural fairness has kicked in. I understand the basis of the comment. Of course I do. But at the time, those two people were good people, hardworking managers. They got themselves into a, 
into a rut that many of us find ourselves into. And if you talk to each other, you'll be subject to disciplinary action. Subsequently, they came into mediation, I'm delighted to say, mm -hmm. and we did manage to resolve it for them. However, um, that's, uh, that's, that's something I think that organizations can do, is to create the environment for dialogue to happen, by bringing mediation in or by creating a resolution-type culture. Okay. Yeah. One of the Thanks, second, Leslie, by the way. It was a great you. question and something I'm sure many people would relate to. One of the questions that came in prior to the, um, to the webinar was, how can managers gain confidence in mediating issues within their teams? I think a manager is absolutely key to, to any resolution culture within organisations. And I was delighted to see the, um, the launch from the McDonald's report in terms of looking at soft skills. Um, and obviously supported by great many organizations. And I'll send a link out about the McDonald's report and, and to soft skills and their importance to the UK economy after the webinar. Um, for me, it's about recognizing the challenge that our managers have. It's about supporting them by giving them the skills they need to develop empathetic conversations, to listen, to hear to each other, to hear each other. It's about looking at our leadership competencies and our management frameworks and ensuring that they contain the key skills and competencies we need our managers to possess. We all know the adage that our managers are, are recruited or, or, or promoted on technical skills, but they lack the people skills. Well, that's something I hear so often, but it's not good enough. The, the people management skills in a diverse, complex, global workplace are extremely difficult. It's not acceptable to say we're recruiting our managers on technical skills, but we don't, they don't have people management skills. They, they must have those people management skills. It's not a nice to have. It's an absolute prerequisite of being a manager in a modern workplace. Um, so, but where are the leadership competencies against which, we, against which we recruit? Are those leadership competencies aligned to our core values, our purpose, our mission, our, our vision? Do we reward our managers for the delivery of core competencies around transformational leadership, emotional intelligence, empathy, dialogue building, collaborative practices, or do we just focus on the task in hand and the key performance indicators? What the good news is, Joe, many organisations are saying now, actually, we need to focus on developing our leaders and our managers. And I'm going to do a plug here, and a shame relief to TCM. We have two programs which are dedicated to developing soft skills for the 21st century. Our Diploma in People Performance and Engagement and our Better Resolutions program, our three-day program, specifically aligned to meeting the modern needs of the leader within the organization. So the manager is key. They're central. And as you'll see from the resolution policy, they're at the center of it. Yeah. Okay. One more. And we've got one more question that came in. I think it was from Rupinda, but there's some of you that I've also mentioned. It's how to deal with collective grievances, but also collective grievances that, um, that are often led by trade unions. Okay. Well, we are um, at TCM running the um, Royal Mail's Industrial Relations and um, uh, their Employee Relations at Bullying and Harassment Mediation Street Resolution Programs. And we've been working very closely with the management at Royal Mail Group, as well as the CWU and uh, Unite Unions within Royal Mail, to help embed a culture of informal mediated dispute resolution. Now, the statistics aren't necessarily that, that clear here, Jerome, but before we started working with Royal Mail and before they entered into a legally binding uh, uh, industrial relations framework, there would be regular uh, calls for strike action and ballots for strike action within Royal Mail Group. That has reduced significantly, I'm talking over 50 to 60% reduction, in those cases since Royal Mail has introduced a mediation framework. Interestingly, a number of those have been complex collective disputes in depots and uh, 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 sorting officers distribution centers across the UK. Moreover, tying that into the bullying and harassment cases, uh, of the 50 or so cases that have come through for mediation, 100% of those cases have been resolved. 100% of cases have been resolved through mediation. If anyone's any doubt about the efficacy of mediation, Royal Mail is a shining light of best practice in employee relations. I wasn't saying that when I was on Sky News in 2007 <laughs> or 2009, whatever it was, talking about the industrial action strike in, 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 in Royal Mail. Royal Mail was seen as a basket case in relations to employee relations and industrial relations. Now it's, it won an award at the CIPD's awards last year for best practice in industrial relations. So it works very well in collective disputes, and I run, I run webinars, free webinars, on using mediation in collective disputes and team and group grievances. So I won't have the time to go into the detail here, other than to say it works very well in group environments, and I've mediated a whole call center of 50 employees, surgical teams. Wow, it can work in some very complex environments. I think 40 was a maximum Nicole had in yeah. mediation. Well, that was a whole faculty in a university. Wow.
big big disputes. There are loads and loads of questions coming in. Thank you so much for this. Um, so I'm going to try and come back to some of these questions. I'm not sure if I'm going to get a chance to answer all of them, but there are lots of questions coming through. But what I will do is I'll go through each of the questions if I don't get a chance to answer them in the webinar, and I'll give you written responses to them um, after the webinar. Or uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, but I will try and answer them for you if I can. But we'll, we'll move on, I think, Jerome. And, uh, um, so this is a, a kind of a, a, what I describe as my whole systems model or my integrated people performance and engagement model. So when I'm working with an organization, we'll often start with this model in mind. And I'll just mention it very quickly. Um, the model, at the, at, the, at the top of the model, we focus on the values, the governance frameworks, the strategy within the organization, HRER uh, and, and IR strategy, the systems and processes, both internal and external, because you know, again, if we're looking at some of the stories related in relation to Tesco's and their relationship with suppliers, I've mentioned the NHS whistleblowing stuff, patient complaints, medical negligence, complaints against the police. It's an external and an internal environment we'll often focus on. Um, we'll look at the way that the organization's driving employee engagement, employee well-being. I'm actually an engagement guru on Engage for Success, and David McLeod, who I know very well, speaks passionately about the role of mediation in driving employee engagement. And we'll look at the culture of the organization and ensure that the organization is well set up to embed a culture of mediation within the organization. On the left-hand side, we're talking here about the psychological contract, the relationships, the unwritten rules and contracts that exist between us in the workplace. We'll look at the role of the HR professional, moving the HR professional away from the police force of the organization or the people who are seen as a threat or the people who are custodians of these processes, and actually help the HR to become the arbiters of, of a more common sense approach, working with them to develop diagnostic tools, triaging tools, understanding the nature of conflict and the impact of conflict, introducing the model resolution policy, um, helping the HR to triage disputes. We trained the entire Lloyds Bank and Royal Mail and Kent County Council HR team in dispute triage. It has turned the way they resolve disputes on its head. Lloyds Banking Group, uh, on their um, application for their award for the Personnel Today Award last year, Jerome, they reported that within 10 weeks of having introduced a, a resolution policy in Lloyds Banking Group, they'd saved £450,000 just by triaging more effectively and moving issues into issue resolution. And that information is widely available on the Personnel Today website. And of course, the facilitated conversation that HR can do, where they may well uh, facilitate, as the name suggests, a conversation between our two parties. Management and leadership, we've talked about the importance of that, and I've talked about the importance of competency frameworks and training. The mediation scheme, many organizations, Transport for London, London Underground, I've mentioned Royal Mail, Marks and Spencers, many others, we've gone in and trained in-house mediators who are available to the organization to be parachuted in where they might need them, or you may find external mediation is, is more suitable for, you, suitable for your business. Then at the very end of that, of course, is the more formal end, evaluations, investigations, and so on and so forth. So that, in essence, provides a dispute resolution suite across the psychological contract. That's part of the thinking behind the resolution policy. And on the other side of it, the formal end is, again, looking at mediation when things go wrong or they, 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 they end up in, in, the, in the courtroom. But we're focusing predominantly here on the psychological contract today. And here's the model resolution policy. I've mentioned you'll, you'll have a copy of the resolution policy. So this is what I'm offering to organizations as an alternative to grievance. Um, a new approach for resolving disputes, developing constructive relationships and encouraging positive conversations at work. This is, I think, one of the most radical changes in the grievance procedure since the early 1970s when the grievance procedure was first introduced by ACAS uh, in the early 1970s. So what makes it different? Well, in, in one respect, it's a different name. <laughs> it's a change in, in but as, as someone said to me, but is it not just about language, David? And I said to them, absolutely, but conflict's all about language. If we drive people into a funnel and push them through grievance, it's it's a squeeze. If we open up our language to resolution, so yes, on one respect, it's a change in language, but wow, it's a lot more than a change in language. Direct. It's an attitude. It's an attitude, a mindset, a belief structure. So it's a new approach to grievance and complaints resolution. It's values-based and people-centered. Well, that is so important. The grievance process is dispute escalation and it's risk-averse. This is about the people, your, your employees. They're at the center of this. It's an enhanced triage. I've talked about the importance of that and the role of HR. And there's a much greater emphasis on early resolution and mediation at a much early stage. Yes, mediation remains voluntary, 
but there's a much greater focus on mediation has become a normal, acceptable, credible, credible way. 100% of bullying and harassment cases at Royal Mail have been resolved through mediation. Your organisation could be benefiting from the same level of resolution. Mediation happens within 10 working days of a request for, for a resolution. Most grievance processes, I know organisations that have birthday parties for their grievances. <laughs> It's compliant with ACAS code. Andrew Waring, the Chief Operating Officer, spoke very candidly at a conference recently, fully supporting the shift towards a resolution culture. His argument was that you are at no greater risk at employment tribunal by not following this process than you are in any other process. His words were specific. It doesn't have to be called a grievance procedure. So long as you, the employer, can demonstrate that you're meeting the minimum requirements set out in the ACAS code on discipline grievance, and they aren't, it's not particularly onerous, if the employee requests it, there's going to be a formal process, a formal meeting with the right to representation and the right to appeal. Well, that's embedded in the procedure. So it's very clearly compliant with the ACAS code. It also includes toolkits, guidance for HR, uh, for managers and employees on how to seek resolution and bring a resolution to, to, to the table. So it promotes and encourages positive relationships and constructive dialogue. It's about leaders and managers walking the talk. It's about really resolving our differences. Conflict is ubiquitous. Bruce Tuckman tells us teams will go through four stages of development. They will form, they will storm, they will norm, they perform. Every manager on this webinar, every manager in your organization, every role that we ever play within a team, we will experience conflict. It's how do we handle it? Let's handle it better. So it draws on five values, and these are at the heart of many of my customers' values. Fairness, respect, empathy, dignity, dialogue. Empathy for me is one of the missing links. We have an empathy deficit in most of our organizations. Not because you don't employ good people, you don't employ empathetic people. We encourage them to leave that at the front door because we have a process-led approach to resolution. When we can put ourselves into the shoes of another person, amazing things can happen. So how does it look? Well, there's a little flow chart. That has to, you, know, you would expect there to be a flow chart, but it's not anywhere as complicated as the flow chart you might experience in your current grievance processes. So the issue is raised. Um, so people often say to me, well, what's it called? Do I raise a grievance? No, I, I request resolution. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an H1 form or a G1 form, or whatever your form is called, it becomes an R1 form, a resolution request. Um, that resolution request can be lodged with a union, a line manager, an HR professional. HR would act as a custodian of this process, so they would be actively seeking to gather data in relation to the number of requests for resolution that come through to them, because then they become a central repository for data, and they can start to measure the impact and effectiveness of this. HR then triage, or whoever it is that's triaged it, and they've got two, in essence, two options. There's early resolution, where the focus is on a resolution meeting with the employee, a facilitated conversation, it might be some form of external mediation or a, or a line management intervention, but the focus is on a resolution. What do we need to do now to get this issue resolved so everyone can get back to work together? And creating an environment where the two parties can come together, so it's predicated on dialogue. There may well need to be an external uh, or external mediation, uh, someone parachuted in from outside the organisation. Or the triage might say, you know, something that's a bit more serious here, uh, we'd like to do something a little bit more formally, and that might lead into an investigation, a fact-finding environment, a mutual evaluation, or it could involve a formal meeting with the employee, with their representatives, to try and assess and understand what the real, what the real issues are. Again, with the overarching focus on resolution, the individual has the right to appeal that, and clearly, if the individual is not satisfied with the process, then you may need to seek to take alternative steps to resolve it but primarily the focus is on how can you, us, we, get together and resolve this issue. Um, and that's absolutely key here, I think. So the, the employee, the responsibility of the employee in this process is that they're going to raise issues early. They won't sit on them and wait for a couple of years before there's another incident. They'll raise issues early. Their manager's going to listen to them. Which stops conflict escalation. Absolutely. Get it. Intervention. Nip it in the bud. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult, but people are often fearful of doing that that they will engage with the other party. It's, it's not acceptable for an employee who's operating in the resolution culture to say, I, I won't sit down with the other person because you can't trust them. Well, you would say you wouldn't trust them because you're in conflict. The issue here is our organization drives and encourages direct dialogue, and we're going to work with you to help create the conditions and give you the courage to do that. 
But is it acceptable for an employee to say, no, I'm not going to sit down with the other person? It leaves our hands tied. I, I, one of the questions that came up, I'm just going to pull it up in front of me, was asking about anonymous complaints. Um, so let me see if I can find that. Or someone was asking, how do you deal with anonymous complaints? Well, it, it's impossible to deal with anonymous complaints. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it, anonymous complaints are, 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 are sort of the pernicious end of the pernicious procedure. Um, they're, they're not possible. The organisation and the employee has a responsibility in a safe, constructive environment created through the resolution policy to actually be part of the resolution process. They take responsibility for the conflict and take responsibility for the resolution. So there's no need for anonymity? No, absolutely. There's no need. Then it wouldn't serve any particular purpose. For human resources, they provide a coaching and mentoring service for managers. They're there to support them. They've got the managers back, but they're not taking the manager's side. Mm -hmm. And many employees perceive it. HR will automatically take the manager's side. And unfortunately, when we look at grievance processes, most organizations, and I can't speak for everyone, most organizations, the organization in over 90% of cases does find on the manager's side. In one organization I worked with, it was, it was well in excess of 98%. And there are others where it's, it's almost 100% of grievances are found on, on the side of the manager. So maybe the employee's got a point. Um, maybe HR do need to think about changing their role and shifting their focus. I've talked about the triage stage, talking about the coordination of the mediation scheme and providing that support. And for the line manager, it's to ensure that they are buying into this. They're engaging with it. They're engaging in training, that they're possessing and able to demonstrate through their appraisals and PDRs, supervisions, one-to-ones, performance frameworks, whatever the system is that in your organization, that they're meeting these competencies that you, the employer, need them to demonstrate. That the managers are fostering the kind of culture which promotes dialogue, encouraging people to be open, encouraging people to be honest, encouraging people to share their feelings and not being scared, excuse me again, of the snot and the tears that comes when people talk about their feelings. That your managers are able to facilitate dialogue. They've just got the confidence to do that. Um, and they walk the talk. It's so important for the manager to walk the talk of what you, the organization, said. And rather than this say, do gap, as the uh, employee uh, David McLeod and Nita Clark were talking, it's, it's the, it's, I, I, I walk the talk. I believe in the values and I live the values through my behaviors. It's not difficult. This isn't some rose-tinted world view of the world where we're all walking through, skipping through the meadow singing, come by our Joe. <laughs> This, this is not difficult. <laughs> yeah, we will, we will be out of business. That's a very good point. It's not difficult. We make it difficult for ourselves. So here's some approaches. Again, just um, move through these quickly because I think I've covered most of them off. But here are the possible resolution approaches. It's a plethora of positive, progressive employee relations practices. What it's wonderful. It's opening up dialogue. It's seeking a resolution. Um, we talked about triage, facilitated conversations, mediation, team building, coaching, resolution meetings. Yes, investigations. Yes, we will need to do them. Yes, let's do them properly. Yes, let's produce a really high quality report. But let's do less of them. Um, you know, I was uh, at a conference again at Royal Mail Group, and Brian Scott, the head of the Unite Union, made a very impassioned plea saying investigations, all they do is they damage relationships. He was absolutely clear from Unite that the less investigations that happen in organizations, the better the organization is. We will need to do them, but when we do them, let's do them properly. Yes, with that formal resolution meeting, and of course, the, the appeal. It's important to stress that in terms of the, uh, the stages. Oops, I've just clicked onto the next slide, which is convenient. So we're going to move to another poll. So based on what I've, I've said today, and based on your own experiences and, and thinking, would you consider introducing the resolution policy in your organization? So this is poll number two. I'm going to launch the poll now, and I'd be interested to know your thoughts as to whether or not um, you would be interested in setting up a resolution policy. We'll look at some of these questions in the meantime. Okay, so that's 70% of you have voted. Still have over 200 attendees on the webinar, so uh, I think this is a fairly good poll, actually, Jerome. In terms of the, is it scientifically valid? I never know what scientifically <laughs> valid means, but nonetheless, it's uh, it's an important poll. I'm going to give it another five seconds before I close the poll. So if you haven't voted yet, if you would vote, um, please do so now before I close the poll. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. 
I'll close the poll now. Okay, so I'll share that with you now. I think you'll be overwhelmed by this. So 97% of you on the uh, on the webinar today, and as I said, there's over 200 people. So uh, uh, that's a significant number of you are interested in setting up a resolution policy, and only 3% of you um, not. And I noticed, thank you so much for one of the comments that came through on the back of the last poll where you were um, uh, talking about your grievance process. I'm just going to, uh, because we've got so many questions, it's amazing. Um, da -da 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 -da. I think one of, one of you, and I can't get the, uh, the comment up in front of me, um, said actually our grievance procedure works because we've already got mediation at the very beginning of it. Oh, it was Sally. Sally, thank you so much for your comment. Um, so for those of you who've got a grievance procedure that embeds, embodies mediation, that might be part of it. So that's fantastic. I think that's an overwhelming response in favour of some alternatives. So, Jerome, we've got an enormous amount of questions. I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer all of these in the time because they're fantastic questions. Um, so let's have a... a um, so would you advocate a documented policy on this? So this is Caroline. Thank you much, very much, Caroline. We already take this approach but don't have it written down. Caroline, visibility and transparency for me are absolutely important, so I would advocate a written policy framework. I'm going to share my model resolution policy with you. You feel free to, to use that as you, as you wish. My experience is that when you're in conflict, you feel vulnerable, worried, anxious, afraid. And sometimes seeing something down in writing reassures me that I'm not being experimented on with some new weird fangled thing called medication or meditation or mediation or whatever it is. <laughs> Um, and seeing it in writing, knowing that that's been through due process, it's been consulted with whoever the key stakeholders are in your organisation, it reassures me, the employee, that I can trust the efficacy of this approach. So it doesn't have to be long. You're not looking at you know, an extensive document. It might be a few sides that sets out you, the employer. And it's always good at the start of that document to align what you're trying to do in dispute resolution with the values, purpose and mission of your organisation. And opening it up in that way really makes it a fantastically powerful document, so I would advocate it. Um, thank you. So, so Sally, you've put some into my comment, and, and you're just saying there, well, it really does work. It's about talking and listening. So, Sally, that's the person who indicated mediation was part of your um, uh, part of your organisation. One of the questions that came in is um, the, the possibility of having a resolution conversation without being accused of trying to operate outside of the process yeah. and an accusation of trying to influence or bias the process in any way. Great. Thank you very much for that question. I think it's an important one. It probably goes back to the point I was making earlier about having something written down. This does become the process. So it's not operating outside of due process. This is due process. I think by having it written down, codified, engaging key stakeholders, that is physical and transparent, and you're having a conversation, a dialogue in your organization, a dialogue about disputes, a conversation about conflict, making sure that people feel engaged and recognizing that it happens. In the best organizations, it happens. Not at TCM, Jerome. Never. Not at <laughs> TCM, we wish. <laughs> but it happens. And we can acknowledge that. And we can be adult enough to recognize it happens. Because having, being adult enough to acknowledge it happens encourages adult-to-adult -adult dialogue in our businesses and our organizations. And for those of you who are fans of transactional analysis, you'll know that moving away from that parent-child relationship to an adult-to-adult -adult dialogue is a big shift. And you probably, if you are into TA, you'll hear that this is driven a lot by TA thinking and practices, transactional analysis, thinking and practices. Um, gosh, there's so many questions. Is there a method? So there's a question there about not being able to find the manager. I'll probably have to come back to that one. Um, so in my experience, Jane, uh, you've said that in my experience, not everyone agrees to mediation. What would you advise me on how to try and find a resolution in those circumstances? I know that mediation has to be with agreement, so we can't force people. Absolutely right, Jane. And for every one good reason why I can give people to go into mediation, I'm up to 1,654 really good reasons why they should never go in a room with that person. And any suggestion of being put in a room with that person is indicative of the organization's lack of compassion and empathy for my needs and goals. Wow, how do we get to overcome that and encourage the person to enter the process? Well, we've got lots of information uh, on securing a commitment to mediation. But in a nutshell, there are three things that concern people before they go into a mediation process. It's the process, it's the psychology and their emotional needs, and it's the substantive issues in the conflict. When I talk to people, 
I want to hear what their underlying emotional needs are. And they often tell me they need to be heard, understood, for the behaviours to stop, um, to challenge, maybe to also to find out, have I done anything to upset you? So people have questions that they have. They want to have that understanding. They want to have that recognition. But then I look at the process and, we, and I say, well, what do you want? How would you like to do that? Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to be able to talk with them. I'd like to be able to hear what they've got to say, but I don't want to meet with them. So, OK, well, how, how can we create an environment where you can talk and listen? What is blocking you from wanting to meet with them? And then listening carefully, because they'll tell us what the issue is. I'm fearful of repercussions, of recriminations. I'm fearful of making it worse. I'm fearful of escalating the situation. Well, let's try and reassure you in those areas. Let's listen to your concerns. Let's recognize and empathize and, and appreciate just how difficult this is for you. But then the mediator or the skilled mediator is able to be able to present the mediation as a safe and constructive space to have a difficult conversation. We can underline the important role of the mediator. We can underline the efficacy of the process. Our model, the fair mediation model, is highly effective. We can share that with people. And then we say something really important, Jane. Go away and think about it. Don't decide now. Think about it. There's no rush. And if you say no, fair enough. But the door is always open to mediation. And people do come back. It might be a day later, a week later, a month later. Sometimes we get a call a year later. But when they're ready, they're ready. And we are there ready to support them. And that's the kind of environment that people are going to feel um, that they can, that, that, a compassionate, nurturing, and supportive environment. And that's the kind of environment that's going to drive our businesses forward, Jerome. I would argue that the grievance process doesn't just inhibit employee relations. It doesn't just inhibit good working practices. It inhibits creativity and innovation. And in the current economic climate, where the UK seems to be bucking a bit of a global trend here at the moment, and you know we can all be proud of you know the, the, the performance of our UK economy, but wow, there's nothing is for certain at the moment. And what's going to drive our economy forward is innovation and productivity within our workplaces. And if we don't get these issues right, Jerome, we lose opportunities for innovation and if we lose opportunities for productivity. And so we lose people. And we lose good people. So those are my final words on, on, the, on, on this, really. I've absolutely loved delivering this webinar uh, for you. I hope it's been useful. Like I said, we'll send the recording across. Thank you so much for the questions. Apologies if you asked the question and you, and you didn't get a response to it. I don't think we have the time. However, um, I, I will uh, respond to every single question. Um, so, 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 I say apologies. I'm on LinkedIn, very active on LinkedIn. If you're interested in, uh, in connecting with me, please do. And uh, we can share our thoughts and, and experiences on LinkedIn. But for now, I'd just like to say to all of you, thank you so much for attending. Jerome, thank, thank you, you very much. My pleasure as always, David. Yeah, it's great working with you, great working with you. And uh, I wish you all the best in creating a culture of resolution in your organizations. And uh, it will come as no surprise to you that I would love the opportunity to work with you and helping you and supporting you on that journey. But for now, thank you very much. And uh, as I said, 97% of people on this webinar are looking for a change. That's going to stay with me for a long time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Right.